I want to focus particularly on the reforms proposed recently in editorials and opinion pieces in major journals that argue for the removal from the lexicon of words and terms that may be offensive to the peoples of the post-colonial world. That is to say, people like myself. This includes, for example, the replacement of hundreds of botanical names that reference the word kaffir, the equivalent of the N-word in the colonial era, a deeply offensive word. The most sweeping of these reforms involves the invalidation of offensive eponymous taxa, taxa named after morally deficient people, such as the Beatle and Ophthalmus Hitleri, which of course references Adolf Hitler. There are thousands of scientific names that are inappropriate, offensive, or associated with people who held views that are utterly repugnant by the standards of our time. But where should we draw the moral boundary? Who should be the arbiter? This uncertainty has led to cause to invalidate eponyms altogether. But that raises a new problem. What will be the fate of taxa name for non-white people? For example, the species of spider named Anilocymus nelsoni, after Nelson Mandela. And don't forget that a great many words in common use, as well as most standard international units, are eponyms. The ampere, the newton, the joule, and so on. Should the association of James Watt with the slave trade cause us to replace his eponymous unit of power? The fact is, eponyms abound. Do we really care about the moral hygiene of the people they commemorate? Your surname, after all, is very likely an eponym. Alongside calls to delete eponyms from the lexicon have been demands to expunge words that might offend marginalized groups. These include, for example, the word alien, as in alien species, because it could hurt the feelings of people regarded as aliens by the US government, even though that usage is, well, alien to the rest of the world. There isn't time to list other examples, there are many, but I will make one observation about the authors calling for these reforms. They're almost all exclusively white or based predominantly in white majoritarian countries. Despite the debate being about the sensitivities of post-colonial peoples, people of color, our voices, rarely make it into the opinion pages of your journals. The editorials of many journals have been reduced to echo chambers in what has become a white-on-white -white debate, a debate that excludes post-colonial voices. I don't doubt for one moment that you are well-intentioned. Yet many among you choose to speak for us, to know what our feelings are, and seek to redress the harms of colonialism and slavery by revising language. Past harms that your ancestors inflicted on my ancestors. You seem to imagine that words will somehow set you free. I want you to think for a moment just how absurd, how offensive that idea is, how condescending. How patronizing. Scientific terms that are offensive may well warrant reform, but shouldn't it be us, the so-called victims, that demand these reforms? I would argue that you seek to impose language that you deem to be inclusive upon the post-colonial world, not so much on the grounds that arguably offensive words harm us, people like myself, but because you want somehow to dissociate yourselves from the odious heritage of the West. If reform is needed, it is ours to demand, not yours to dispense, to bestow upon us. It should not be the voice of white privilege dictating once more to the non-white world what words we shall use. Deciding on our behalf what hurts us and what doesn't, as if you would know, as if you even could know. All you do by expunging words from the lexicon, by defacing statues of your colonial heroes, by demolishing your monuments, by censoring your literature, is to seek to deny your past. Are you really doing these things for us? It's akin to Poland deciding unilaterally that Auschwitz is offensive to Jews and so demolishing it. Or Germany deciding that the word Holocaust evokes unpleasant memories in Holocaust survivors and so prohibiting its use. I don't deny that there are words and terms in the scientific lexicon that are offensive to the post-colonial world. Of course there are, but when it comes to such reforms, the Western world almost always acts 
purely out of self-interest. Let me give you a recent example. It relates to the genus of trees known as Acacia. These are called wattles in Australia, and one of them even forms part of Australia's national emblem. Then, research showed that the Australian wattles belong to another genus, that the name Acacia correctly belonged to an Afro-Asian species. But Australia was determined to claim the name for itself. There's no time to tell the whole story here, but suffice it to say that the matter was taken to the International Botanical Congress of 2011. And there, it was decided that the rules of botanical nomenclature would be overridden, set aside, and the name Acacia awarded to Australia. Africans would simply have to suck it up and settle for a different name for their trees. Where did this International Congress take place? Need you ask, in Melbourne, Australia. How inclusive was it of African voices? Well, judge for yourself. And where was the proposal to deprive Africa of this name debated? Behind the paywall of Taxon, which charges a subscription of 928 US dollars per year. That is more than the per capita GDP of 20 African countries. So here's why I point to the hypocrisy of the West when it comes to reforming the scientific lexicon. On the one hand, changing the names of some hundreds of species of Australian bottles was alleged to be too difficult, too inconvenient for that great technologically advanced nation. Yet we in the developing world are now told we must replace thousands of putatively offensive taxonomic names and plunge botanical nomenclature into chaos. In the midst, mind you, of a global biodiversity emergency. Merely to assuage your guilt for colonialism? Is this what they call equity nowadays? I suspect many of you would have seen the movie Oppenheimer. There, towards the end, the disgraced Oppenheimer is assured that one day, posterity will restore his reputation. But when that day comes, Einstein warns him, it won't be for you. It will be for them that they do it. That, in my view, is what the West attempts to cleanse the scientific lexicon in the name of inclusion amounts to. You are doing it to salve your guilt, to signal your virtue. You are certainly not doing it for us, the so-called victims of the colonial enterprise. What value would the American constitution have had if, instead of beginning with the proud assertion, we the people, it began with a royal concession. I, George III, King of England. How devoid of meaning, of significance that would have been. Yet that is precisely what you seek to do. Shakespeare understood this problem well. After she murders the king, Lady Macbeth is distraught, not because of her crime, but because she can't erase her guilt, the blood on her hands. She washes them, she rubs them, she wrings them. Her anguish is intolerable. Out, damn spot, she cries. Out, I say. Will these hands ne'er be clean? Here's the smell of blood still. Not all the perfumes of Arabia will sweeten this little hand. Don't imagine for one moment that words alone will sweeten the little hand of colonial oppression. Of course it is true that words create our reality. I get that. It is also true that words matter and that their meanings matter and that words evoke feelings. I understand that. But words come into being through usage, not through imposition. All you succeed in doing in the name of this brand of inclusion is victimizing yet again the victims of colonialism. By what measure is this not the quintessence of the white privilege of which you speak so much? What then, I hear you ask, is the way forward? Well, how about asking your national academies, the Royal Society for instance, to engage with their counterparts worldwide and assess perceptions and attitudes relating to academic language. After all, national academies for the sciences, the arts, the letters, the humanities, these exist pretty much in every country. What would be so wrong in seeking their views, our views? 
Isn't that what inclusion is supposed to be all about? Thank you.